In this video, I will be explaining how to implement NAT on sub interfaces. There will be DHCP configuration and access list implementation as well. I have set up this topology to represent how an enterprise client can connect to the internet. All devices are Cisco devices made up of the 7200 series Cisco router and the IOU for configuring switching on GNS3. So I'm starting up from the internet router and I'm going to configure the link between the internet router and the IXP router. I'm using 8.8.8.8 to represent Google DNS just to give us the feel that we are pinging the internet. So I'm, I have the description to IXP router. Now I am going to configure the link from the ISP router to the internet router. So you go to global configuration mode, get into interface G2 slash zero and configure the IP address. Since I have 8.8.8 .8 on the internet interface, back on the ISP router, I'm setting it to 8.8.8.1 slash 24. The description says connection to the internet. No shutdown to bring up the interface and it will be a good thing to test connectivity before proceeding. And it's also a good thing to type <laughs> correctly. So fair enough, uh, we have a connection. And now we are going to um, configure the link between the IXP router and the client's router. You do not need to set this up on a live network because the ISP owes you the responsibility to get to connect you to the internet so you do not need to connect to configure any device that belongs to the ISP your responsibility ends at your own router which is the DMAC so the client's router is where you will be configuring so here on the ISP router I'm configuring the interface that should connect to the client and I've, I'm also using a Google DNS IP 4.2.2.2 so here i am on the uh, client's router which is actually your own responsibility and i'm setting up the interface that should connect to the ixp which is the one i'm giving 4.2.2.1 and i put a description that says connection to the isp no shot to bring up the interface and it's a good thing also to test connectivity or reachability between both routers and good enough we have connection to the IXP from the client's router. So on the client's router, let's try to ping at the internet. I just want to explain the importance of routing, okay? So as you can see, we do not have any connection, no connectivity or reachability from the router 3 which is the client's router to the internet so i'm going to put in a, a simple static route here uh, using the command ip route 8.8.8.8.0 and then the subnet max of slash 24 and then the gateway to get to that route which is the ixp router and of course a name a description so that it makes it easier to remember when you're looking through your configuration file so back on the ixp router there has to be a route also to get to 4.2.2.0 which is the network that exists between the client and the ixp without this the ixp router would not know how to respond to a ping coming from the client's router with a public IP of 4.2.2.1. So we put a statement and then put the description as well. Now I'm trying to test reachability and good enough we have reachability. So I'll come back to uh, the client's router and try to repeat the same thing I did before to the internet. And now you can see that we have reachability to 8.8.8.0. Now I'm going to set up the sub interfaces on the client's router that will connect to the LAN. 
So because I have VLANs here, I am going to set up the physical interface with no IP address, just bringing it up by saying no IP add, no shot is enough there. So I'm going to go into sub interface F0 of 0 0.10 and put a description that says that this is the uplink for VLAN 10. And of course, you go, you, are, you need to define your encapsulation protocol. There are two majorly before, the dot one key, which is the industry standard, and the Cisco ISL interswitch link, which Cisco has discontinued. So I'm setting up the IP addresses now that have this defined the encapsulation, which is the IP is 192.168.10.1 slash 24. And then I move over to sub interface f0 of 0 dot 20 define my encapsulation encapsulation dot 1q20 and an ip address 192.168.20.1 dot 20 dot 1 slash 24 next is dhcp configuration so i'm configuring the dhcp for vlan 10 ip dhcp pool vlan 10 network 192.168.10.0 Default router 192.168.10.1, DNS server 192.168.10.1 and 8.8.8.8. .8 you can use the DNS IPs given to you by your IXP. You do not need to use the Google DNS, but you can use the Google DNS if you have no ISP DNS server given to you. Or you can as well add this to the one given to you by your IXP. So the next thing is to exclude the IPs that you do not want the DHCP server to give out to clients on your network. And then it's a good thing to also exclude the IP address that you're using, as your DNS server or your default gateway rather, and then the broadcast IP of that subnet. So the next is the DHCP pool for VLAN 20, and I'm defining the network as 192.168.20.0 slash 24. And then default router is the IP address configured on that sub interface, which is 192.168.20.1. And of course, my DNS server, which is the default gateway as well, and the Google DNS server of 8.8.8.8. .8 so if I've configured this, the next thing is to exclude the IPs that I still do not want the DNS, the DCP server to lease out, which is the IP I have on the sub interface as my default gateway as well as the broadcast address of that uh, subnet so i have excluded the ip and at this point i am done with dhcp configuration on my router so the next thing i'm going to do at this point is to go to my switch of course to configure vlans and all that i need to have done but before that i will need to define my nat okay because that's the essence of this uh, whole lab so the first thing you do is to define the NAT pool. Usually you have one public IP given to you by your IXP. So you define the pool by saying IP NAT pool, you give a name, whatever name you want to give, put the IP given to you by your service provider, the first way it starts and then where it ends. And of course, the subnet mask you have on that one interface connecting to your IXP. And then the next thing you want to do is to define the list of private IPs that will be knotted if that word ever exists. So I'm using an extended access list that makes it easy to update this access list. So IP access list extended, I'm giving it a name as NAT. And then of course, I'm going to put the sequence numbers as well as the subnets that are allowed here. So the first one is subnet 10.0 24, and I'm allowing that to any. So I have the second so a sequence there, sequence 20, for subnet 20. Next is the configuration of the actual NAT statement, IP NAT inside source list. And then what is the uh, access list there? It is the NAT extended access list configured earlier. Then pool, what is the pool? The pool defined earlier is LAN to internet. You copy that and put in there. And then you said overload. Overload is when you have uh, one public IP address and then you have multiple private IPs that should be knotted to that one public IP. So the next thing to do here is to define my in and out interfaces, which is IP NAT in and IP NAT out. So my IP NAT out is the interface that connects to the ISP. Note that. And your IP NAT in, this is where everybody, most students make mistake, 
is not the physical interface connecting to your switch but the sub interfaces for different vlans so as you can see here i have the f0 of 0 0.10 and f0 of 0 0.20 each representing VLAN 10 and VLAN 20, as you can see there. So uh, the next thing to do is to go to the switch here. And on the switch, I'm going to define my trunk port as well as my access ports. And of course, I need to create VLANs. So E0 of 0 is my interface connecting to the router. So I'm configuring it as a trunk encapsulation dot one q And then switch port mode, trunk. This makes it a trunk port, and I'm going to allow the VLANs that I want on this interface. So for security reasons, I'm allowing only VLAN 10 and VLAN 20 on my trunk port. So the next is the interface that connects to the PC in VLAN 10. And I've configured it here as switch port mode access, and I'm saying switch port access vlan 10 as you can see i did not create vlan 10 but automatically the router knows that there is no way i'm going to allow something that does not exist so the router created vlan 10 for me so i'm going to create vlan 20 so that we just see how it is done vlan 20 name sales it is important that you create your vlan so that you can name them what you would remember if you do not create it and the router creates it for you, there will be no name associated to it. It will just be VLAN 10 or VLAN 100, whatever VLAN number it is. So I'll configure it as an access port and put it in VLAN 20. So the next thing I'm going to do is to go to the uh, routers that I'm using as my PCs and try to configure the interfaces connecting to the switch as dhcp clients that way they will acquire ip addresses automatically from my router that is serving as my dhcp server so you just go to the interface and say ip add dhcp and fair enough we have an ip already on pc one so i'm going to go to the second one uh, and then do the same thing to have it acquire an ip address through the DHCP server. So you go to the interface and you say no short and IP add DHCP and we have an IP 20.2. So the next thing we are going to do is to check the interfaces using the show IP interface brief and you also see that we have an IP there and the method is via DHCP. So at this point, uh, I'm back to uh, the first PC and then with IP uh, show IP interface brief, we can also see that we have 10.2 on the interface connecting to the switch. You notice that the PC uh, one, uh, if, if that's what to call it, the PC in VLAN 10 has IP from 10.2. The other one has IP from 20.0 subnet. So they are off. They are both in different VLANs. So now let's turn up a Wireshark and try to see how NAT really works. So I'll have the Wireshark uh, application turned up and I'll run a ping from one of the PCs there to 8.8.8.8. And then on the Wireshark, let's see what is actually happening. So I'm doing a repeat of 100. On Wireshark, you can see from what is shown on the screen that the source IP is actually 4.2.2.1 going to destination 8.8.8.8. And that is an echo request. Now, the reply will come from 8.8.8 .8 texting to 2.2.2.1. And there is no where 192.168.10.2 .1 .2 or 20.2 was mentioned in this. That shows you that the IPs are being translated on router 3 as they are exiting towards the internet router. So that's how that works. If you enjoyed this video, Please subscribe to this channel, like this post, and turn up post notification. Thank you for watching and see you in my next video.